This video is brought to you by the Nicholas County Historical Society. Historian, Rock Foster, presents, The Battle of Carnifex Ferry, Civil War Series, Part 1. Sunday, March 10, 2024. At the Southern Baptist Fellowship Hall, 201 Irish Street, Somersville, West Virginia. Good afternoon. My name is Rock Foster, and this is the story of the Civil War Battle of Carnifax Ferry. Uh, it will be presented in two parts. Uh, part one is somewhat of a prelude. Uh, it will cover the political situation that existed in Western Virginia prior to the Civil War and the formation of West Virginia and the logistics that plagued the mountainous battleground and the skirmish of Kessler's Cross Lanes. Part two, and nobody throw eggs please, will cover the actual battle of Carnifax Ferry in depth and the closing of that battle. Uh, major portions of this talk uh, are taken from the book September Blood by Mr. Terry Lowry. Uh, it is an excellent reference of the battle. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge the contributions of works by Mr. Tim McKinney from Fayetteville and, and Mr. David Phillips of the uh, D.C. area. Uh, the music, Soldier for My Lord, is performed by Appalachia. And the music, Sally Garden, is performed by Sarah Thompson and Buddy Griffin. This is in memory and honor of those brave men uh, that fought in this battle. Uh, the Civil War was in its infancy in 1861. Only minor skirmishes were occurring following Fort Sumter's bombardment on, on April 12th. Uh, the Western Theater had uh, also only seen minor action. On May 26th uh, of 1861, Brigadier General George McClellan ordered three columns into the Western Virginia uh, to protect the B&O Railroad and to aid the pro-Unionists of the area. The filthy races as it was known, often referred to as the first land battle of the Civil War, featured Union General T.A. Morris routing the troops of Confederate Colonel G.A. Corbett Field on June 3rd. The Philippi Races, as it was known, uh, has been uh, credited with being, as I said, one of the first land battles of the American Civil War. In Western Virginia, during the summer of 1861, uh, McClellan, as commander of the Department of, of Ohio, established a number of outposts as a defensive perimeter in a generally east-west running line stretching from, from Cheat Mountain to uh, Golly Bridge. The Union defense extended from these points eastward to Winchester and westward to Charleston. The Union defense extended um, to uh, where Brigadier General Joseph Reynolds was in command of the eastern line from Summersville to Cheat Mountain. He also secured the Stanton Parkersburg Turnpike. Uh, General Jacob Cox was in command of the portions on the western end from Golly Bridge to Charleston. And uh, General Cox established a camp at, at Golly Bridge while Colonel John Lowe was left in charge of troops at Charleston 
and Huntington, or better known at the time, I guess, as Guide Dot. Uh, the B&O Railroad, which ran across northern West Virginia, was a major target of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. And uh, Brigadier General William Rosecrans was stationed at Clarksburg, and his job was to protect the B&O. Uh, General Kelly also protected a portion of the B&O. This, this is the Rollsburg uh, trestle, and it was... Uh, uh, heavily valued and, and guarded heavily uh, during 61. Troops, uh, Union troops were beginning to enter uh, Western Virginia on a larger scale and many of them were arriving on um, paddle wheels uh, very similar to this one. A portion of Cox's troops had won um, a victory over a small group of Confederates at Barbersville on July 14th. A much larger group of his troops had been defeated uh, on July 17th at Scary Creek in Putnam County by troops of the former Virginia Governor uh, Henry Wise. And Colonel John Lowe was made somewhat the scapegoat of, of that affair. In spite of the minor victories won by the Confederates, uh, they were forced eastward up the Canal Valley by the amassing troops in the valley and also in fear uh, of the northern troops. General McClellan and General Rosecrans had both won significant victories in the north at such places as Rich Mountain um, over Confederate Lieutenant Colonel John Pegram and at Laurel Hill on July the 11th and Carrick's Ford uh, on July 13th over Brigadier General Robert Garnett. McClellan was making quite a name for himself and on July 22nd, the day following McDowell's defeat at Manassas on the 21st, he was asked uh, to Washington to become the commander of the Army of the Potomac. This is a, this is a drawing from um, a book, uh, Our Soldiers in the Civil War. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have a complete set of those and also of, of Harper's Magazine. Uh, and this is, this is a rendering of, of Rich Mountain. This is uh, Bealington or Laurel Hill near Philippi and Corrick's Ford. These minor yet strategic northern victories uh, helped to drive General Wise from the Canal Valley for fear of being cut off from the southern troops and his supply line along the James River and Canal Turnpike. Cox's troops frequently patrolled this road and numerous skirmishes occurred. And if you've ever traveled on Route 60 between Anstead and uh, Golly Bridge, you might ask yourself, where in the world did they ever find any room to fight because there's just not any. It's just mountainside. <coughs> when Wise was forced to leave Golly Bridge on July 24th, he burned the wooden bridge crossing the mouth of Golly River. And with, with the Golly in bushes, meaning that it was as high and swift, and immediate crossing by Cox, was just out of the question. So Wise led his troops to Bunger's Mill west of Lewisburg to rest and resupply on the 31st. Wise was not noted for his retreat from the Canal Valley, but for his, what he called the retrograde uh, movement. And while in camp one day, Wise heard a young private speak of of Wise's retreat from the Gali. 
To which Wise boldly responded, Retreat, never day, never dare call it a retreat again, sir. It was only a retrograde movement. And to which the private replied, uh, I don't know nothing about your retrograde, General, but I do know we did some darn tall walking. <laughs> Brigadier General Henry Wise had served as a governor of Virginia prior to the Civil War period. Because he had shown favoritism to Western Virginia leaders, he felt that, or the leaders felt that he would readily be readily accepted by the locals in the Kanawha Valley. Uh, this proved not to be the case. Uh, Wise was born in Virginia, <clears throat> and following his formal education, he entered politics. He was an orator's orator and was known to ramble at times. He had no military training, yet he had the political clout to receive a commission as a brigadier general. He proved, however, to be a competent officer. On August 6, Brigadier General John Floyd was in White Sulphur Springs and was ordered to determine a combined strategy with Wise. Unfortunate for the Confederate cause in West Virginia, the conference between the two old political foes would set the tone for the events to follow. As oil does not mix with water, Wise did not click with his new commanding officer. This clash nearly rivaled the hatred each of these men had for the North. Each of their armies would suffer because of it. Union General Cox once said, if Wise had been half as much trouble to him, meaning Floyd, as he had been to Floyd, the Union troops would have had quite a hard time of it. John Floyd was born in Blacksburg, Virginia. After graduating from college, he became a lawyer. He served in the Virginia House and was elected governor in 1848. Following his service as governor, he again served in the House of Delegates. He was appointed Secretary of War by President James Buchanan and served until his resignation on December 29th of 1860. His resignation was because the President refused to order Major Robert Anderson from Fort Sumter to Fort Moultrie. His resignation drew suspicion from critics that he had been illegally transferring large numbers of arms from northern to southern arsenals and profited from it. He was tried and cleared of illegally handling $900,000 in bonds but remained a thief in the eyes of the northerners. Floyd was commissioned a breeder general in May of 61 and became Wise's superior. This fact would never be acknowledged by Wise. Floyd was a political appointee and a military incompetent. General Henry Wise was once quoted as saying, I had conceived an idea that a man who had been Secretary of War knew everything pertaining to military matters. I soon discovered that my chief was as incapacitated for the work he had taken as I would have been to lead an Italian opera. In spite of his incompetence, Floyd had a reasonable plan of attack. It was to combine forces with Wise and move against Cox at Golly Bridge, forcing the general to relinquish control of the Canal Valley. With the valley in check, he could easily strike Ohio and move up the Ohio River Valley to Wheeling. He could then break up the proposed meeting of the loyal government of West Virginia. What would eventually become of the western counties of Virginia? On April 17th of 61, 
a convention in Richmond passed an ordinance of secession that the state of Virginia would join the new Confederate states. People in the western mountainous section of Virginia had different social and economic life that the, than the eastern part of the state. It was sparsely populated and people had to rely on themselves, not slave labor. They had to produce their own economic gain. Western delegates to the convention who were opposed to secession came home and held mass meetings denouncing it. On May 13th, the first Wheeling Convention laid the foundation for statehood. On June 11th, the second Wheeling Convention convened and established a restored government of Virginia with Francis H. Pierpoint, later Pierpont, as the first governor. Congressmen from the, quote, restored state were seated in Congress and President Lincoln recognized them. This secession from another state without the state's permission is unparalleled in American history and has been questioned for constitutionality. They effectively had seceded from the secession. On December 31st of 62, President Lincoln signed a bill authorizing the admission of the new state of West Virginia, which was to be called Kanawha. The new state was effective June 20th of 1863. Wheeling was made the capital and Arthur I. Borman was elected the first governor. 39 counties were included in the proposed state. Five additional counties were included to get more counties with Democratic Party majorities. Republicans did not want former Virginia slave counties in the state, but accepted these because of the mountains and and in these counties, it, it gave them somewhat of a natural barrier between the two states. The eastern panhandle consisted of six counties that were added for protection, and because the DNO Railroad wanted all of its track included in the new state's boundaries. So, what, what is the big deal about Carnifex Ferry? Why? Why was this battle uh, that has been overlooked by many historians overlooked? Number one, it prevented uh, Confederate reoccupation of the Canal Valley in 61. Uh, it restored communications between the, unif the Union forces in the north and south of western Virginia. It prevented a possible Confederate sweep up the Ohio River Valley to Wheeling for the purpose of foiling the creation of the new state of West Virginia. It allowed President Lincoln a public relations boom with the sharp cut of a southern entity seceding from a seceding state. Uh, it upset the local southern sympathizers because it became apparent that the war would not end soon, thus aiding the creation of the new state. And it reduced the South's source supply of, of precious salt. So what really happened at the Battle of Carnifax Ferry? Who were the players? What did the stage look like? But, first, Let's quickly look at a brief incident that happened about two weeks before the battle. It was technically a, a skirmish at Kessler's Cross Lanes, but it was better known as the Battle of, of Knives and Forks. While General Cox was at Golly Bridge on August 13th, General Rosecrans ordered the state of Ohio under Colonel Erastus Tyler to Kessler's Cross Lanes. 
it was just that, an intersection of the Gully Bridge and Weston Turnpike, and a connector road which crossed the Gully River at Carnifax Ferry and continued on to Dogwood Gap and the James River and Canal Turnpike. There was a general store and a few homes located there. Both of these roads were major routes during that time period. Dolly Bridge and Charleston lay west and to the east, Somersville. Continuing on northward, the Gully Bridge and Weston Turnpike passed through several northern outposts to Clarksburg. A short distance east toward Somersville, a road known as the Wilderness Road diverted south to Hughes Ferry, which also crossed the Gauley River. At that time in the Civil War, cross lanes could well have been Rome to the fighting armies. The Gauley Bridge and Western Turnpike was the direct link between Cox at Gauley Bridge and Rosecrans at Clarksburg. Rosecrans was setting in Clarksburg with approximately uh, 7,000 troops just waiting to go south. The James River and Canal Turnpike was the lifeline between Floyd and Wise. Tyler's need to protect this highway deep in the Confederate territory was self-evident. He was to guard the road, Carnifax, and Hughes Ferries. Tyler arrived on August 15th. Several small skirmishes were reported between Cox's advance guard and the rebels. Floyd was near Dogwood Gap on August 17th. Cox, fearing a combined attack by Floyd, Wise, and the local militia, ordered Tyler closer to his encampment at Gully Bridge on August 20th. That same day, Tyler's pickets near Carnifax Ferry were ambushed and General Wise skirmished with some of Cox's troops at Hawk's Nest. Feeling a slight relief on August 24th, Cox sent Tyler back to cross lanes. And Tyler arrived the morning of August 26th, having received notice that Floyd was in the area. And Floyd had actually moved in there uh, from uh, the coming in on Sunday Road and crossing the, the Carnifax Ferry. He was now uh, at what he referred to as Camp Gauley. There was speculation as to the seriousness that Tyler had paid uh, the notice of the, the rebel pickets because he was accused of himself not posting or posting insufficient pickets uh, to the war of the ensuing rebel attack. This was a, this is a sketch of camp at Cross Lanes. Tyler was not an ignorant man. Uh, New York born, he was educated in Ohio. And prior to the war, he was in the fur business and spent his time hunting in, in Western Virginia. He was teased about returning <clears throat> to Virginia to skin the rebels. Little did he realize that he was about to lose his. <coughs> Nine companies were cooking breakfast along the Gully Bridge and Weston Turnpike when they were hit by four regiments of Floyd's army, ergo the Battle of Knives and Forks. Artillery firing shells and canister brought havoc upon the brave men in blue. The results were disastrous. After 30 to 45 minutes, the route was over. The Confederates had attacked from the east and driven the unaware northerners up the hill toward Zor Church. 
Although the surprised men fought bravely, all they could do was retreat and hope to re regroup to fight again. The Union troops, they scattered in all directions. It was basically a Confederate route. <coughs> During the melees, Confederate Colonel Christopher Tompkins of the 22nd Virginia captured a Union officer and 15 of his men. Thompson told him to throw down your arms, boys, and you won't be touched. A most generous gesture. A Union Captain Dyer died at the Vaughn House, located at the crossroads, while trying to be saved by local women, a Mrs. Vaughn and a Mrs. Malcolm. Blood stains remained on the back porch of this house for years. Tyler straggled to Golly Bridge with about 50 or 60 of his men. Major John Casement rallied about 400 of the Union men and took them via Whitewater, Bucks Garden, Buffalo Creeks, and Elk River to Charleston to safety. Later, more would be found or straggled into the Golly Bridge Union camp. Some of the Union troops were hidden and cared for by local Union sympathizers. But that's another presentation. Uh, some for as much as two weeks. They would eventually make their way back to the Union camp. General Cox at Golly Bridge, he was very understanding. But when McClellan found out, he was absolutely livid. The results could have been much worse because there was only two killed, 29 wounded, 110 captured. The official records reported 245 U.S. casualties and 40 Confederates. <clears throat> Floyd's victory would be short-lived. His superior numerical force had driven off the Federals. 2,000 Confederates versus 700 Union. That's pretty good odds. As he entrenched his corps at Camp Golly, he declared he could defeat the world, the flesh, and the devil. And next time we'll see how he fared when the numbers were reversed. We're done. Thanks again, Rob. Very informative. Any, I'm sorry, Joe. Go ahead. I was just going to say, any questions, uh, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Uh, the major part of the battle will be next time. Uh, I just felt that it was important to set the stage for what was going on here at the time because just to jump into the battle, I, I think you would miss, uh, I hate to say it, but you'd overlook the politics 